So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribe. Madison has just been designated in December, Truax Field, as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. On November 6th, there were 2.64 million votes cast for the Office of Attorney General. And our guest today, Attorney General Brad Schimmel, finished second by only 17,190 votes, six-tenths of one percent. So that's why we're doing, I want to thank you for doing an exit interview. General, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I, I've only done, this is the second interview I've I done since it, Election Day. And of course, I've always enjoyed having a chance to talk with you. Well, the margin tightest of any statewide offices, six-tenths of one percent. You could have sought a recall. You considered it. Why'd you pass? On it. I, we weren't going to pick up 17,000 votes, and I, I, I don't think the optics of that are great either. It, 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 we weren't going to pick up that, and the election is the election, and I think the right thing to do is accept the results and, and move on and, and let the new person step in and, and uh, be their own person. General, you must have been surprised. Were you like Mitt Romney in 2012? You only had a victory speech written, sir? I didn't have either speech written. You didn't. And. Um, and frankly, the night of the election, we didn't know which speech we didn't know which speech it was because when when we had to get everybody out of that hotel room, we didn't know the results. Um, so I I kind of gave up. You uh, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Speech. <laughs> okay, but you must have been surprised. I am a little bit. I think a lot of other people were more surprised. One of the challenges I had on the election uh, trail was convincing people that this wasn't a lock, that there were a lot of factors out there that made this a risk, and people didn't want to hear it. Oh, Brad, you got this. You're going to win. We're not worried about you. Well, there was reason to be worried. Were you worried after the Democrats won in the 10th Senate District and the 1st Senate District and then uh, Justice Ballot, Dallet, excuse me, won in April? Um, I think those things were warning signs. I still thought I could outrun those things with the law enforcement support I had that I thought we could do it, but it didn't happen. Okay. What do you think was the biggest factor in finishing second? Well, I think the third party candidate. I took 47,000 votes. Took 47,000 votes and you and lost by 17. Yeah. And his, his reason for running was because he objected to the Supreme Court sanctioning gay marriage. That's not a guy who took away liberal or Democrat votes. He, he took votes from me. What would you have done differently in the campaign, General? Um, you know, I would have started fundraising earlier. Okay. I, uh, right away, my first year in office, I would have gotten going on that more because you needed those money, that money when the time came for an election. Um, but I don't have a lot of regrets. I think that um, I focused on the things that were important to me and I focused on the things that I think I was supposed to as Attorney General. It just, it didn't work out. Wisconsin wanted to go a different way in its overall statewide politics this year. Well, one of the things that really intrigued me, and I'm not denigrating in any way the Attorney General-elect Mr. Call, but it, the Marquette poll in September, 81 percent said they didn't know him or didn't know enough about him. Two months later, he wins. Can you explain that to me? Well, I didn't have as much name recognition as I would have liked. Were you in the high 50s or 60s? Excuse me for interrupting. I don't remember. Okay, excuse me. Um, but, it was, but I wasn't as high on name recognition as I would have liked to have been after serving four years in the office. Um, but I think ultimately this, it wasn't, I think the Attorney General's race just didn't get any oxygen. It was, it was there was too much else going on between the Senate race, between the Governor's race that we just weren't we weren't on people's radar enough. And was there a backlash by anti-Trump voters? Did you suffer from that? Well, our polling told us that we we were having difficulty um, as Republicans with um, some suburban female voters who their stated reasons were they objected to President Trump's language. So I think that was a factor in there too. Um, did you detect, uh, did your polls suggest that there was any fatigue from Governor Walker? Because he was up in 2010, 2012, 20, 2014, 
any walker fatigue our, play a role in that, General? Our polling found some of that, too. And I think the governor's polling saw it, too, because you saw him switch from doing a lot of campaign ads where he was in the ad to switching to using other people to talk, to present the message. And I think his, I suspect his full polling was telling him the same thing. Do you think um, he was a liability in your campaign, Governor Walker? No, I don't. I, I don't think so, because ultimately what he what he did deliver was such great prosperity in the state and such optimism from employers and and employees alike. I think those are good factors. And when when the economy is doing well like that, it's easier to attack the crime problems that we were attacking. We had resources for things. You know, a liability. He was a great benefit to me with when he was able to produce $100 million to put into school safety programs that I was able to able to administer. You know, to have that happen in the last uh, seven months or so before the election, that's, that wasn't a, that's far from a liability. That's a big benefit. Right. Um, well, your whole career, you got your dream job to be an assistant Waukesha County DA. Then you were Waukesha County DA. Then you ran for Attorney General and won. And now you're going back at beginning the weekend as a Waukesha County Circuit Court judge. Um, why did you want to be a judge? Uh, you know, I never had, to be perfectly honest. It, I had always wanted to be an advocate, and that's what I've been as a prosecutor for 29 years. But, and it wasn't initially what I wanted after, you know, I, I hadn't been planning, well, if I lose the election, or even in the first two weeks afterward, Let's jump for this. But I, I'm a praying person, and I prayed a lot on this, and um, I saw that this, this is the right path for me. My daughters are 17 and 15. Mm -hmm. I've been running for office for 14 years. Mm -hmm. um, my oldest, you know, since she was four, this is what she's been doing, um, living with me, being gone. They, don't, they gave up asking a long time ago whether I'd be home for dinner on a weeknight, because the answer was no. Dad won't be home. Um, it's time for me to be home for, uh, at dinner time with them. It's time for me to take my 15-year-old golfing. She loves to golf. I've only taken her twice because since she started being interested in it, I've been campaigning for re-election and I've been gone. We're going to fix those things. This is a great opportunity for me to still be involved in, in public service, which is where my heart is. Um, I'm going right to criminal court, so I won't have to go cold turkey from the criminal justice system, I'll still be able to play an active role. I can still do the things that are so important to me, like working to build more drug treatment court programs, to, to foster treatment alternative and diversion programs that are changing lives, helping us winnow out who are the violent criminals that need to be locked up, who are the criminals who need treatment and help that we can help turn around. I can still do that as a judge. So this. I'm excited about this opportunity, and I'm getting back two hours of drive time every day. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, well, I want to ask you about that. Have we, we've made progress in fighting the uh, abuse and addiction of uh, opioids and heroin and methamphetamine. Have we turned the corner? I would say we're turning the corner because what we've done now is we have really aggressively attack the gateway drug, mm -hmm. the, the prescription opiates. We've seen, a thir in the last four years, we've seen a 30% drop in prescribing of opioids in Wisconsin. That's phenomenal. We've seen Wisconsin repeatedly uh, lead the nation in our drug take back efforts. That means that the average household gets that they have a role in this. That's key, because that means the message is out there to the average citizen in Wisconsin. That's turning the corner. Now we've still got in front of us that those who are already addicted switch to heroin more quickly, and that's that's terrible. We've seen the the in introduction of fentanyl into the system, and by the way, we're not just finding that in heroin; we're finding it in marijuana, methamphetamine, cocaine, and heroin. This is this is an extraordinarily dangerous drug. So we continue to lose far too many people. We have to continue to work on changing the stigma that. But that substance abuse disorder is, it's a sign of, it's a character flaw or a sign of moral weakness. It's a disease. We need to start treating it compassionately like a disease. And I think that's one of the places where we are finally starting to turn the corner. 
you know, back in the early 1990s, I started serving on the board of directors at the Waukesha County Addiction Resource Council. And our, our mission statement back then was to change the stigma associated with addiction. And I can tell you, 20 years later, 25 years later, we hadn't made any progress. The last couple years, I've started to see a little bit of progress in changing how people view this. Is the abuse and addiction of these drugs that we've been talking about the biggest challenge that your successor, Josh Call, faces in office, sir? Absolutely. We, we're, we're not out of the woods. Like I said, we haven't turned the corner. We're turning the corner. He has a lot of work in front of him to continue to try to lead the state and, and work and resolve this issue. How better equipped are local law enforcement agencies, police departments, village police departments, sheriff's departments to deal with this addiction and abuse epidemic, sir? Well, we've got, we've got the vast majority of law enforcement agencies in the state now are participating in drug take back programs. Um, we have um, almost 450 medication return units around the state now where they're playing a direct role. Um, we've put Narcan in the hands of most of the law enforcement agencies in the state. And we've got, and we've seen an attitude change in law enforcement where I'll tell you five years ago when you'd suggest to them that this person that's repeatedly committed crimes based on their drug use, that the answer for them is a treatment court. They looked at that with skepticism. Now we see law enforcement supporting those kind of ideas because they recognize that it's a revolving door. And they've also seen it hit too close to home, that they can see this can be any family that struggles with this. So that's one of the other really key things that helped me conclude that we're turning the corner, is that we've seen the criminal justice system, the at, not everyone yet, but the attitudes of most have changed. As you've traveled the state, I'm sure you heard this argument, and I'm not advocating for it. If someone has been brought back by Narcan, four, five, and six times, sometimes twice a day. Why not let them end their life? They seem hell-bent to end their life. And I'm not advocating that, but you've heard the argument. How do you answer? The answer is that this, this could be any of us and that this is a disease. We need to get that person help. And yes, we may have to come back and bring them back to life a few more times, but every day that they continue alive is another day that we can get them help. That is someone's son or daughter or father or mother, you name it. Um, these are people worth saving. People are redeemable, I believe that. And frankly, Steve, I couldn't have been doing what I've been doing in the criminal justice system for the last 29 years if I didn't believe people were redeemable. You sound like that is what you're most proud of, the idea that Wisconsin has yeah. confronted this epidemic. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, lighter subject. Yeah. Um, you went from running as a county DA to statewide partisan office. Yeah. Lessons of running, lessons of taking that big jump, lessons of partisan politics. You know, I'm going to miss um, traveling around the state. Wisconsin is a gorgeous state to see. And when, you're, when, you, when you really take on, <laughs> when you really take on running for office, um, and getting to every part of the state, you just find the most wonderful people, the most beautiful places. Um, I'm gonna miss that. I was on the phone on my drive home last night with some folks from Rich and Richland County who have become dear friends, most wonderful people, and they're urging me, Brad, don't be a stranger. Come up and see us sometime. Um, embrace it. Embrace getting to see those places. But you know what? Don't do it for too long because I have neglected my family in, uh, in doing that. So I think it's the right time for me to go back, spend some time r with my wife and my kids, and, uh, and leave that statewide thing behind for a while. Were you surprised at the rough and tumble, eye scratched out nature of partisan politics right now, General? Surprised? No. I mean, I, I knew that's what was happening. You'd have to be living under a rock to not know that right now, no, no matter what the other side does, the other side's going to object to it. And um, you, it's, I've, I've joked for a long time, you know, we could, we could announce at the Department of Justice that we'd found the cure for cancer and somebody would report, Department of Justice, did they sit on the cure for while millions suffered? I mean, you just, it, it's crazy. But how do we get back to the 
civil discourse, civil political discourse envisioned by our founding fathers. Any thoughts? Boy, if I had that thought, you, you I wouldn't be going to work another job. I'd be <laughs> selling the book with that answer in there, Steve. I, I, I don't know. And I think, you know, I, I, had an, I heard it, a homily at our church recently. Um, our deacon made a reference to something that Mother Teresa said. And she said, she was asked, how do you cope with the numbers? And she said, don't worry about the numbers. Take care of the person right next to you and the numbers will take care of themselves. And maybe that's the answer, is that each of us take care of our own words, take care of our own actions, and maybe it will start to ripple. You mentioned fundraising. Was that, um, you're probably somebody that didn't enjoy dialing for dollars. I did not. Did not. <laughs> and yet you wish you would have started earlier. I so wish the I had. The, the role of fundraising? Yeah, you got it. If you want to get your message out, if you want to have that name recognition that you need on election day, you have to have the resources to do it, and I, I wish I'd done better at that. The role of third-party groups. Did yeah. it cause your campaign to lose control of its message? Um, somewhat, yes. I mean, honestly, and, and, I've, and Josh Call and I have sat down and talked, and um, we both, I think we both agreed that ours wasn't the, ours wasn't the nastiest race in this, uh, in this cycle. I think things stayed you know, there were a couple hard hits, but it stayed pretty calm. It pretty stayed pretty much on issues. Um, the third parties, I don't know. I don't think that they made that much impact. I think, frankly, they waste a lot of their money when they do such terribly negative stuff sometimes because everybody's turned off now. Your opponent said you were, they called you. This is not me calling you this. The most partisan attorney general in Wisconsin history. Given some yeah. of the lawsuits that you had your office of solicitor yeah. general, in. Your response? I, I don't know how that can possibly be true when I had, I, 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 I challenged, go back and look at um, law enforcement door endorsements over the years. And I don't know when there's been an attorney general who had more bipartisan support from law enforcement. I had every sheriff that endorsed in this race, every professional police association that endorsed in this race was endorsing me. Um, we, we focused on public safety and that's what we did. 90% of the time. Did we, did we file some lawsuits against the Obama administration, against the federal government? Mm -hmm. Yes, and mm -hmm. absolutely, and I wouldn't change that. The Clean Power Plan, it was misnamed. It was going to destroy tens of thousands of Wisconsin manufacturing jobs. It was going to raise the costs of the average citizen's um, home energy bills by double digits. That was going to hurt some of the people who could least afford that our seniors, our people on limited incomes. That was, a, that was a terrible law. We needed to fight that. It's important to make those changes, but the way the federal government tried to do it was wrong for Wisconsin. That was, that was my job to defend that. The ACA lawsuit that you joined in Texas. And that, won. Uh, and won, the federal judge agreed, but that put you on the defensive in the days before the election, sir, in terms of the pre-existing yep. conditions. Any regrets about joining that lawsuit? <sighs> it was the right thing to do. Um, we had, um, I think, frankly, the whole thing was, it was, a, it was the biggest political lie of the election cycle because there aren't, uh, there aren't candidates who off for office on either side who don't think we should take care of people with pre-existing conditions. They differ about how yeah. we should do that, but everyone agrees. So to say that I don't, or Governor Walker doesn't, or Senator Vukmir didn't want to take care of people with pre-existing conditions was wrong, but the law was unconstitutional, and more importantly, it was failing. It wasn't delivering on the promises it made, and it was going to get worse. You know, one of the things that got neglected last year, we won another Obamacare lawsuit uh, earlier in the year in which the federal government had to give Wisconsin $88 million back that it took to try to pay for the, the broken promise about the windfalls that were going to be experienced from the insurance companies. And we were getting another $30 million back from September. This, the federal government was, going to, was bleeding money on what they wanted to use to pay for that program. It's not going to survive, not, not just constitutionally, but practically. We need to have a better system in place, and unfortunately, Congress didn't get their act together and get it done. If you were 
next Monday, raising your hand and taking an oath for another four years as Attorney General, would you be leading the charge for a pre-existing condition statute in Wisconsin? I would certainly be advocating, and we had. We'd been working with the legislature. We'd been working with the Office of, Insur of Insurance Commissioner um, because it was our conclusion that Wisconsin law does cover people with pre-existing conditions now, and it did last year. Um, we wanted to see the Office of Commissioner, of, uh, Insurance Commissioner issue that pronouncement that it did. They ultimately didn't issue that. Um, can we talk about the issue that Rape Kits Backlog played in your? Okay. Uh, Mr. Call, you saw the ad, only tested eight kits in the first two years. You were able to clear that backlog before the, the November 6 election, or at least announce a timeline mm -hmm. by the end of the year. Um, how significant was that issue in your loss, General? You know, I don't know. And like I said, I don't know if there was even enough oxygen in the air for the Attorney General's race. I think a lot of people were voting straight ticket. I think that's what we were up against. I managed to trim some of that away, but the sexual assault kit initiative in our polling, people were largely confused by the claim because on the one hand, they heard that they were all tested, and then they're hearing that, well, it didn't get tested fast enough. You know, for, for over 20 years, these things accumulated. We got it done in three years. Um, that's, that's a pretty remarkable accomplishment to get that all done. Um, Mr. Call also used the kicking ass everyday commemorative coins. Do you wish they'd never been printed? No, I'm, I'm glad I did that. Law enforcement appreciates those, um, and it's important. It's, it's about $4.50. And, you know, I sent, one, I sent a card and um, one of those coins to, there was a city of Portage officer and a state trooper who rescued a suicidal woman from a raging river right after some of those floodwaters we'd had. They went in, one holding a branch, the other one making the human chain with their arms locked. Mm -hmm. They were being pulled under the river themselves and yet they did not retreat back to the shore. They kept reaching and extending until they got that woman brought her up to the shore, resuscitated her, and then she got the mental health help she needs um, to be able to come back to being a healthy member of the community again. I gave each of them a $4.50 coin. I don't regret that at all, Steve. The lame duck bills, were you consulted in their drafting? No, you were we, had, we had no communication on that uh, at all. We were. Um, I never spoke with anyone from the legislature. They did reach out after all the drafts were done. They reached out to a member of our team just to ask if, um, if for, for legal advice, and that's it. Do you think they uh, infringe on the uh, ability of future attorney generals, whether it's Mr. Call or you, if you run again? By the, are you thinking about coming back in four years? I, I, Steve, I don't know what the future holds. Okay, for I understand. I know where I'm going now. Do you think they improperly infringe on the ability of future attorney generals, whoever they are, to do their job? I think this has been this has been blown out of proportion relative to how this affects the attorney general. Um, to suggest that discretionary money that comes in from lawsuits that that has to be spent with the approval of the legislature, that had already been the case. We'd been we'd already been submitting requests to the legislature before we spent discretionary money. Under the Constitution, they're supposed to control how the how funds are um, distributed. distributed yeah. yeah. So, um, I think that's overstated. Um, the approval before lawsuits that may slow things down. It's going to make the there's going to be an extra step for the attorney general before they settle some suits. Um, but ultimately. Um, I don't think it's going to be a big change. The two-week limit on casting absentee ballots. Now, they're back in court asking Judge Peterson, this violates your early order. Do you think it does, sir? Well, first off, the original case isn't done. And that's been, it's still pending. That's been ignored by, by a lot who've written on this. We're still waiting on a decision from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals right. on, on all of those rules. Frankly. I don't think it was necessary for the legislature to take this up again. I think we, we wait for that decision, but they've, they, they make their choices on how they do that. But we'll get that decision one of these days, and then we can make a determination about how to go forward. My job was to defend state law, and that's what we did, and we did it very effectively. Do you 
personally think that there should be a two-week limit on absentee ballots b before before a general election or a primary. Um, you know, that's a policy decision for the legislature to make. Um, but behind their policy decision was the interest in having it be equal. That that if you live in a township, you get the same amount of time to early vote as someone who lives in a metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. To me, that does make sense personally. But again, as Attorney General, I didn't set those policy decisions. My job was to defend the law the way they write it. I don't understand why a Republican Attorney General can have an Office of Solicitor General, but a Democratic Attorney General cannot. Should that Office of Attorney General been maintained under Mr. Call's tenure? administration? You know, again, that's a legislative choice. I, um, I was glad to have that opportunity. It gave me the ability to hire um, some attorneys that are the kind of caliber that you don't normally, you aren't normally able to hire into public service. And, um, and they did very effective work. They, they won an awful lot of cases over the four years that we had them. Um, the legislature became concerned. I mean, Mr. Call has to live by with the things he said on the campaign trail. And he said he thought he would take a different focus with that group and focus them more on consumer protection and environmental protection. Um, the legislature heard that as something that they perceived as a threat to the state's economic environment. They make choices. And, you, and what you say on the campaign trail, you, it can have consequences. The, the, the group SNAP that represents uh, those abused by uh, priests had asked you to open an investigation into uh, sexual abuse by priests in Wisconsin, like was done in other states. You chose not to? We had, uh, we had one complaint that came in that we are actively looking into. Actively. And that's what, that's what we told, that's what we told the individuals from SNAP, but um, they wanted me to make public statements condemning someone. I don't do that. I've been all these years as a prosecutor, I've learned you don't indict by, by press release. You do the investigation, and if there's a basis to bring charges, that's when you indict the person. You don't do that in a press release. In exit, uh, exit interviews, I often ask people this question. Have you taken the cure from partisan politics? <laughs> do you want some time <laughs> now as a judge to think about it? Um, Will you think about running for attorney general again, potentially running for the Supreme Court, although the justice that you might disagree with most often is Ann Walsh Bradley. She's not up until 2025, the future. You know, in all of the things I've done, I've tried to have both feet in that, in that vocation when I'm there. And I'm gonna put both feet into being a judge. I'm gonna put my whole heart into doing that the best I can. If you'd asked me oh, 14 years ago, would I have run for district attorney in Waukesha County? My answer would have been, no, I don't want to be a politician. Um, if you'd asked me six years ago, would I have run for attorney general? I would have said, no, I'm never going to run for attorney general. And then, and then I did. Um, I, w I, didn't plan, I didn't plan to be running for judge six months ago. But now I am. I'm excited about this opportunity. And yes, I am looking forward to, um, to a little respite from the uh, partisan politics. If one of your teenage daughters in a few years comes to you and said, Dad, I want to run for partisan office, what advice are you going to give her? I I'm going to tell her to do the best she can. I'm going to tell her to do the right thing, no matter what. And if doing the right thing, do if doing what in your heart is the right thing, doesn't get you reelected, then you live with that and you move on. Attorney General, soon to be judge. Brad thank Schoen, you, Steve. Thank you so much. Good luck, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the interview. Appreciate it.